Hello, I'm Claudia Pazos-Alonso. I'm a fellow in Portuguese and Gender Studies at Wadham College. And I'm Simon Park. I'm uh, a fellow at St Anne's and my specialism is uh, Portuguese Renaissance Studies. And today we're here to uh, talk a little bit about uh, this wonderful uh, first edition of the Lusiads uh, by Camões, uh, held by Wadham Library. And it's uh, 450 years since the, the first publication of this uh, epic poem, um, which was first printed in uh, 1572 in, in Lisbon. Um, and this book has a kind of key role in the history of Portuguese um, literature, um, doesn't it, Claudia? That's right. Um, uh, it it uh, um, more or less uh, the death of Camões coincided uh, with uh, Portugal losing its independence to Spain for about 60 years, which was rather traumatic. So uh, it projected him um, as a sort of a hero of, uh, 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 with a national epic. The book itself, we don't know exactly when it came to England, uh, this particular copy, uh, but we know it was given to Wadham uh, by a former student, Richard Warner, and interestingly enough, uh, he also uh, uh, gave to Wadham copies uh, the, of the folios of Shakespeare. Yeah, and I think that um, uh, acquisition of the Shakespeare folios and this book, uh, the, the Lusiads, at the same time, uh, speaks to, uh, or is quite interesting, because um, Camões and his poem have a kind of similar status within the Portuguese-speaking world as Shakespeare does in the English-speaking world. That's right. I mean, you know, they are uh, associated with their respective countries. Um, having said that, uh, Camões is, 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 was in fact um, uh, in a chapter uh, of one of the books uh, by our, uh, one of the former wardens at Wadham, Morris Bower, uh, who wrote about the epic from Virgil to, to Milton. And he talks about Camões as the, the first uh, great sort of uh, Renaissance uh, epic writer. Yes, and uh, his work is very influential, I think, in all kinds of studies of the, uh, of the epic. Um, and has certainly been very important for the study of, of Camões in particular um, over the decades. Um, mm -hmm. I think if we uh, look at the text and think about when it was first um, printed and when it was first published, mm -hmm. actually it's quite a surprising uh, book mm -hmm. because at the time uh, poetry wasn't really um, printed. Um, it was mostly circulated mm -hmm. between uh, different people in manuscripts, so in handwritten mm -hmm. uh, books, um, sometimes but not always lavishly illustrated. Um, and, and so Camões really in, inaugurated an, a new age in, in, in printing in, in Portugal. Um, his was the first epic uh, to be printed. He was the first to receive um, from the king a stipend, a kind of reward um, for having written something. Poets at the time spent a lot of time complaining about the fact that they weren't uh, very um, esteemed in the court. Um, and so Camões really shifted things um, in Portugal. So um, the, the book um, as a whole is the story of uh, Vasco da Gama's uh, journey in 1497-1498 um, to Calicut in India. So it's uh, looking back from the 1570s to this earlier moment in Portuguese history where Vasco da Gama created, uh, opened up a new sea route between Europe and Asia. Adam Smith um, always said that... Uh, the, the two great defining moments of, of history, and this is obviously a very Eurocentric view of things, um, were Columbus's discovery of the Americas and Vasco da Gama's um, uh, discovery, in inverted commas, um, of, of Asia, his, his arrival in India. Um, so this kind of telling of this story is about glorifying uh, a moment, in a key moment in Portuguese uh, history um, and creating uh, a kind of heroic figure out of um, Vasco da Gama. So how was the book received? I mean, how did it come even to be into print? Did it have to have any clearance? Yes, so um, uh, 
in the period, um, this was a moment of uh, religious controversy um, in Europe. Um, we all know about Henry VIII and the founding of the Church of England and how that was um, him wanting to uh, get out from underneath the Pope and the regulations of the, the Catholic Church. Um, uh, but that was a wider um, European uh, phenomenon, the Reformation. Um, and in Portugal, um, a very Catholic nation at the time, uh, there was the Inquisition, which was is famed for being one of the most repressive uh, institutions um, in, in European history. Um, it was uh, very anti-Semitic. Um, it also um, had responsibility for uh, pursuing people for all kinds of vices um, and was known for being very strict. Um, and in order to print a book in the 16th century, um, there was censorship both by the crown, um, but also by the Inquisition. And you see the trace of this in the book itself, mm -hmm. in the license um, on this page by Fray Bartolomeo Freire, um, where he describes why the book um, was fitting for publication. Um, and he talks about some of the problems that it might uh, uh, cause. Um, and he talks a lot here about the gods that appear in the poem. So in order to make the story of Vasco da Gama's journey um, more exciting, um, Camoish uh, invents a sort of mythological scheme. So he has Venus as the great protector of the Portuguese and Bacchus as the great enemy of the Portuguese. Um, but um, in the 16th century, in a very Christian context, these gods and goddesses were heathens. They were inappropriate. Um, and here in the text, Bartolomeu Freire really worries that readers um, might, uh, in uh, enjoying the poem, get carried away and think that these were real gods and goddesses, not just fictions. Mm -hmm. um, and so he spends a lot of time here saying that it is uh, poesie e fingimento, it's poetry and it's make-believe, it's, it's, not, it's not real and nobody who is reading this text, um, of course, will never get confused that this might be uh, something heretical and instead will understand that um, Camoish was a true Catholic and devoted to the, the, the one God um, that was uh, uh, the one of the Catholic Church in the period. And so there's a real kind of bubbling under the surface of those sort of reformation anxieties in the 16th century where the church was kind of splitting in two um, and there were all sorts of worries associated with that with um, uh, texts and, and images. So a lot of those pictures of kind of nude classical god gods and goddesses were all had their um, uh, uh, were all covered up by um, as part of these kind of um, uh, religious um, disputes. Well, yes, I mean, you know, some of those episodes must have been extremely shocking to the contemporaries, <laughs> uh, especially the island of, of love in Canto 9, uh, where indeed it wasn't just about naked gods, but uh, about the sailors themselves. Yes. Um, um, uh, here we are at the beginning of Canto 9, where the sailors are about to arrive on this imaginary island. Um, and this bit was one of the most scandalous bits of the poem. Um, and even in the second edition of the poem in 1584, bits of this um, canto and canto 10 were cut out um, because they were seen to be too raunchy. Um, as the sailors arrive, Venus has prepared, prepared for them uh, a treat, uh, which is uh, uh, ends up being a, a series of nymphs on this very um, luxuriant and verdant island. And uh, uh, it's a moment of kind of celebration of having reached India. And it's a kind of uh, seen to be, it's described by Camoish as a metaphorical reward um, for their labors. Um, and so they get this um, very now problematic um, yes. episode. Yes, from a gender studies perspective, I think, uh, uh, you know, uh, the white sailors and native women uh, is indeed quite problematic. Um, yes, and it's mm. uh, often an episode that has been reimagined in different ways in, in Portuguese uh, culture, I think, because of that. Um, but it's Oh, it's interesting to see that even in the 16th century, perhaps for quite different reasons, mm. it was seen as uh, a, a difficult um, part of the text. 
um, and that they wanted to get rid of it because of its eroticism. So in this, um, Kamoish has kind of got everything in the text from kind of heroes and sailors and exotic places and uh, even this kind of um, erotic interlude. But the other thing, of course, that uh, you know it might be read differently today, is 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 the broader framework of the epic, um, which is as you. Um, um, is about uh, a pe the period of the discoveries. And Camões himself was one of the first Europeans who really had this first-hand experience of traveling across several continents. He himself was in Africa, he was in India, uh, Goa, uh, he was uh, allegedly in Macau. Um, so he, he had this experience, this lived experience. Uh, mm. Is his view of the Lusiedish completely imperialistic? What do you think? Yeah, it's really interesting that he had this first-hand experience. And uh, I think having that first-hand experience also gave him first-hand experience of the problems of empire. Mm. And so the text, as you say, is not straightforwardly a kind of panegyric of the, the Portuguese nation, although there are long uh, stretches of the poem that glorify all of uh, Portugal's heroes of the past. Um, but noticeably in the end of uh, Canto 4, um, an old man appears on the, the docks um, uh, just outside of uh, Lisbon as Vasco de Gama is about to leave. Um, and this old man uh, sort of clears his throat and, and the, the crowd falls silent. And he um, starts this harangue of Vasco de Gama mm. and the crew saying how um, the... Uh, what they were heading out to do, which they would call a kind of quest, um, and the, uh, there was a sort of journey seeking glory. He said all of these things, glory and fame, were um, delusions. There were ways of mm -hmm. convincing yourself that what you were doing was something wonderful, when in fact it was going to cause destruction and death. Mm -hmm. um, it was all about kind of mercantile enrichment. It was about greediness, not mm -hmm. about any mm -hmm. sort of... Um, uh, great, uh, honourable, uh, it wasn't any sort of great, honourable enterprise. Um, so it, uh, this is one of the things that has made the Lusiad so enduring over time, is these kind of conflicting voices that are in the poem. Mm. It starts with praise of the Portuguese, and then at various moments, these uh, mm. negative voices um, jump in and, and, and challenge um, the uh, imperial kind of enterprise. Mm. So uh, what does it uh, have to say to an audience today, a Portuguese, but perhaps more importantly, um, uh, a more global audience? Indeed, uh, one of the most recent translations of um, uh, um, Camões' lyric poetry uh, was headed with the title, A Global Poet. Um, what does it have to say to a global audience today? I think the... The poem reminds us, I think, in um, it reminds us that empire wasn't inevitable. Um, it, there are various moments in the texts where these critical voices jump out. Um, there are moments where Camoys is trying to uh, paper over some of the mistakes that Vasco da Gama made, um, both in his negotiations with. Um, the uh, Samadri Raja in, in Calicut, who in fact was not very impressed by the Portuguese. Mm. Uh, Vasco da Gama arrived and there was a sort of um, accusation that they were pirates, they weren't really um, an embassy, um, they didn't have any of the uh, luxury goods that were expected, and Vasco da Gama was sort of dismissed um, to begin with. So to make an epic out of this is actually quite difficult and, and Camões has to include these negative elements. He also criticizes Vasco da Gama in in no sort of in, in very clear he criticizes Vasco da Gama in very clear terms um, about the violence that he uh, enacted um, during his uh, journey. Um, he seems as a kind of very trigger happy uh, sailor and commander um, who was very quick to load his cannons. And, and Camões um, says that this was inappropriate um, at various moments during his journey. So it really takes us into the, the conflicting views of empire. Um, even at the time in the 16th century, we tend to think that it's only now that we're beginning to unpack the, 
um, legacies and, and the, the problems of empire, but really they were there right from the beginning. Um, and things may not have gone the way that we know from history they did go. Um, and so all those anxieties that are there in the text remind us that, that, that history unfortunately unfolded in the way it did, but, but could have gone in, mm -hmm. in a different direction. And I think that's really intriguing to see um, as part of this text.